Let's get started. Everyone, thanks for coming to my talk slash rant about writing and cinematics. Uh, I wanted to write this talk because the bulk of my career has been taking scripts and making them pretty on screen. And I've often gone back to my writing and executive team and said, I have a simpler, cleaner way of delivering this moment. Games have evolved from times when graphics were not high enough fidelity for our narrative needs, so we lean heavily on writing. But with the increased access uh, to 3D tools, animation, and a lot of external contractors, more teams are embracing cinematic storytelling. So this talk is about considerations for your writing that take you out of radio play and into movie land. I also assume you're here because you like cutscenes or want to get to know them better. I feel obligated to say this in every talk, but you don't need cutscenes. Uh, it's okay if you don't want them or can't afford that style of storytelling in your game. Cutscenes and cinematic moments are tools in our story boxes, along with barks, environmental storytelling, and written lore. And since game stories are now getting compared to TV and film in terms of quality, it's valuable to see how we can hone our visual story process. So about me, I've been working in games for about eight years, almost exclusively implementing spoken dialogue into cinematics and gameplay. I've created cinematics for Star Wars The Old Republic, Darksiders 3, Defiance, and a myriad of Telltale titles. At Telltale, I was a cinematic designer on over 20 episodes over three years, and directed two episodes of Tales from the Borderlands. Uh, most recently, I implemented external writing for cinematics in Darksiders 3, and I write and edit for our current title, Remnant from the Ashes. Uh, I don't claim to be an expert writer, but I'm a visual storyteller uh, who implements a lot of dialogue. I hope to share tips uh, for writing game cinematics that will make your cinematic team happy and your cutscene production faster. So here is the scenario I see most often as a cinematic designer. I'm handed a script, if it's Bioware or Telltale, usually with branching choices. I start staging the scene in my head, how the movement and mood of the actors shape the scene, where I can put staging changes. I create timelines, I space dialogue to feel as human as possible. Sometimes I have uh, recorded dialogue, sometimes I have text to speech, sometimes I just read it aloud and create timing cues to that. And look, what was now a page of dialogue is now three minutes long. And three minutes is a lot of real estate in games when players expect interactions almost every second. So the two most common problems I see translating script to screen are this. There's often too much dialogue in a brief divergence from gameplay. It can still be excellent writing and not translate well to a visual format. Sometimes it's hard to know until it's on screen. A voice actor's performance can stretch what you thought was a four second line into 10 seconds. Additionally, dialogue is incredibly complex with intonation, uh, intonation pauses, physical proximity, etc. cetera. Uh, but I can make assumptions about what the writer intended the emotional performance to be, but Assumptions also equals rework. I don't want to assume any writer's intent. So here are ways you can help your team know what you meant. Is today's hectic lifestyle making you tense and impatient? Shut up and get to the point! I'm just gonna, uh, I forgot to preface, there's gonna be a lot of Futurama in this <laughs> talk because uh, it's one of my favorite shows ever. Uh, there's definitely a time and place for lots of words. There are players that want the full lore experience, but this experience should be nested, uh, nested under a ask more questions branch of dialogue or inside optional books to explore. Cinematics are a time investment, so save only your juiciest morsels of story for the Hollywood treatment. Our goal is to make sure the majority of players don't want to hit the skip button. We want the story cinematics to feel like they're part of the gameplay experience. My philosophy is that every cutscene should motivate the player to leap into action after coming out of the cutscene. Cutscenes set the player's emotional investment, the goal, the means, and then they set the player free. So we need to start with why you have a cutscene here and the purpose it serves. Talk to the design team about what they want. Is it a boss intro? Is it setting up a quest? Is it receiving an item? Then think narratively about what you want the feel to be. Simplify your scene to an emotional goal for your player. 
You want to marry the gameplay design context and the emotional goal into a balanced whole. A dynamic don't want to skip this cutscene will include only vital information that will be less impactful to express outside of a cutscene, personality and mood that engages the player emotionally, and motivation to take them into the next game gameplay moment with gusto. Well, I do owe you for giving me this unholy acting talent. A lot of what is. Uh, uh, well, a lot of what I'm going to talk here is about taking your dialogue and living in that role. Can you imagine a character naturally saying everything you write? Get up and read it aloud, walk it out. If there are unnatural moments, ask yourself why, and how would you express that moment instead? Often, that comes to nonverbal dialogue, which I'll talk about. One of the things I see in cutscene writing is a lot of lines, but not how actors move through the space. The characters are launching mountains of exposition at each other. Meanwhile, I'm trying to keep staging interesting by making actors pace around like they're tigers in a cage, because they just gotta keep moving, otherwise it just becomes boring. Cinematic designers can break up long conversations with back and forth camera cuts and facial performances, but that mainly works in calm dialogue scenes. How long can your hero and emperor boss vamp at one another before the player says, come on, I just want to attack the boss? We want the player to feel like the cutscenes add to their experience and not hold them back. How realistic does your dialogue feel when two characters are standing staring at one another? Can you devise any actions that, we, uh, that they'd be taking during the dialogue that contribute to their character and the plot and keep the lines interesting? Don't leave your cinematics team to figure this out. You wrote the words. So think about how they're executed. One example I can give from Darksiders 3 was this scene with Lust. Now there was a lot we were going to go through here because Lust uh, basically confronts Fury with why do you do what you do? You know why why are you a, a horseman of the apocalypse? Why do you fight this fight? And it was a lot of interesting dialogue. It was also uh, like six minutes long, and so we had to figure out well what are we going to do to keep this interesting? Because this is good story, but how do we keep it going? So what we devised was uh, that Lust was this character that. The, the concept of lust is sort of, you can't really touch it. You, you know it's there, you feel it, but you, you, you always want, you have desires, but you can't get it out of your life, you can't swipe it away. So we had this scene where uh, Fury keeps trying to strike lust and start the fight, and lust keeps dodging out of the way and keeps talking to her and keeps feeding things into her ear. And so that's how we kept it engaging, was Fury is actively trying to deal with this problem. But uh, the design and the, just the nature of the character is keeping her from getting further in the action. Think about what your characters are doing with their physical presence to advance the story, not just their voice. Does the behavior of the characters change the story of relationships? If not, why not? Again, you're not obligated to stage the whole scene yourself as a writer. Instead, write notes on where emotional shifts happen that could change the staging. Where should the characters be pulling in or pushing away, avoiding or confronting, etc.? You don't need to go to the other extreme with a walk and talk, where the characters are constantly moving while they talk, but your cinematic designers may be tempted if the dialogue just keeps going. Nonverbal communication is speaking with our bodies, a brow raise, clearing the throat, shrugs, weight lifts, or uh, weight, weight shifts, etc. The physical performance is just as much a part of human character as the words they speak. When writing dialogue, consider if the emotion you're trying to convey in dialogue would feel more honest non-verbally. Non-verbal communication can relieve your dependence on writing long, wordy lines. Sometimes the emotional intention of a four-second line can be expressed with a glance, as well as giving nuance to the character's emotional expression. You should clearly outline the character's motivations to your cinematic team while leaving room for the cinematic team to build their own performance. Aim less for exact acting direction, and think more about what detailed feeling you want to convey. You know, some people actually craft stories. And when the story doesn't have an ending, you don't just create one out of thin air by playing music or having people give each other meaningful looks. Sure, that might manipulate an audience into thinking they're feeling something, but it sucks. Tell me what you want <laughs> what? There are a lot of cinematic narrative cheats, but silent reaction shots are my favorite. Where was this from? 
That's from 30 Rock, the TV show. Uh, in games, a reaction shot can leave space for your player to project emotionally and feel various things. It's good to have an idea of what your emotional goal is, but you can leave ambiguity and expression with silent reaction shots. Let players surprise you with their experience. You can't just have your characters announce how they feel. That makes me feel angry. I see characters as speaking two languages at once. One with their voice and one with their body. Sometimes the body and the voice say the same thing, sometimes they're different. Your dialogue needs to exist in a well-rounded person and not just a voice box. You should consider what you want the character's body to be saying when they speak and communicate that to your cinematic team. Again, think about the feeling you want to express and work with your cinematic team on the best way to execute it. Screenplay format has ways to format nonverbal non communication, facial expressions, body, lang body language, gestures, but we aren't always called to specify nonverbal cues in game writing for cinematics. And if you're an external writer, this can be a hard point to get across. Write director's notes that go along with each line. Think about the voice direction and the acting direction. So in this example, I just threw something together in Excel. This will not only be a reference for the voice actor, but also the team creating the cinematic. Worst case, the cinematic team doesn't use your acting notes, but they use the action as a guide for the new direction that they come up with. So in this example, it's character mom saying, if that's what you really want, the director's note, which would be going to uh, voice direction, smiling with sad eyes is something you want to be conveyed through the voice, and then the action is turns to look at framed family photo. And so this is like classic Midwest mom <laughs> uh, tactics. Um, but uh, yeah, so it just gives you uh, a physical direction and it creates that emotional feeling of when, where am I going with this? And it's, it's sometimes easier to describe the action the person would take if, because we're all human and we all understand a lot of body language than it is to try to explain, you know, oh, she needs to be sad and manipulative. Uh, you don't want to write that. You want to write something where she's uh, she's reflective, and but you don't you want to contain it in just a moment. And another person can read that and go, oh, I know that exact moment. I've experienced that, or I know I know that from media. If the scene still feels too long and expository, look where you can trim your dialogue to include only crucial information. Remember, the mainline cutscenes are there to deliver any plot required. Uh, any plot requiring mood or information that you can't do in gameplay. If your cinematic has choices, create a more questions option, or create functionality to talk to an NPC later. Mass Effect was great, at, Mass Effect 1, uh, was great at seeding interesting topics like Anderson's past, or with the Spectres, or with Garrus's grudge against CSEC. They gave outlets for those who wanted to know more, but they didn't make all players sit through their life stories. So you've written an amazing script, one full of stunning imagery, character-motivated action, and succinct plot information. But maybe your company doesn't have the budget to create your epic Helm's Deep battle cutscene. Uh, maybe you don't have expensive mocap rigs and devoted cinematic animation team. Maybe you're just struggling to get resources to make good facial expressions. <laughs> These are extreme examples, but there are common things you may write that will make your cinematics team heads explode. What, uh, what can you, as a writer, do to set up engaging cinematics on a limited budget? I have a list of a few things to consider that will keep your cinematic and design team from uh, cursing your name under their breath. So this is a list of things as a cinematic designer. If I saw them in a script, I'd get up and walk away and say, no, can't do that. But then eventually I'd come back around and try to brainstorm or compromise what we're trying to accomplish. Characters touching each other for extended periods of time. This is obviously a tough constraint for romance games, but uh, it's just trying to get the rigs to like each other and not jitter. It's very, very hard. Uh, physically handing off objects on screen is hard to get attachments set up correctly. Uh, avoid described cloth moving, like you're pulling back a curtain or a drop cloth. Cloth is also very hard. Uh, any more than five characters is a ton of animation and staging coordination, and it's very expensive to render in the scene. Your characters are walking around on uneven terrain, and your animation team doesn't want to perfect every footfall. Uh, also, liquid in glasses are often shown in cutscenes as solid blue masses in cups, because liquids are hard. <laughs> so, just off the top of my head, um, 
here are a couple of creative solutions that I would come up with, but it's something you can consider when you're writing. Uh, one uh, example I have is from when we were making Walking Dead Season 2 in Episode 4. It opens with this giant zombie horde. Clementine is in the middle of a zombie horde, and we had to figure out, well, we can't render the hundred zombies we want in the scene. So we created cards that were just, you know, 2D cards in the background to sort of see the idea they were further away. But then we still needed fidelity in front of us, in front of the camera, to be like, this is still this huge crowd, and it's, it's dense, what do we do? What we ended up doing was we took about 12 zombies, and we would put them in a, their own timeline, and just push them behind the camera in every shot. We just set a new key, and we rotated the herd, we rotated the, uh, the block of zombies, so it looked different in every shot. But it saved a lot in terms of performance, because we couldn't render all of those zombies, but we're just we were using the same zombies in every shot, just popping them around. I personally think it's great to shoot for the stars, but it's also good to come prepared with backup plans. Worst case, talk it over with your cinematic team. They probably have a ton of creative solutions like this. So I kind of flew through, through this. Um, but uh, So my final thought here is writing is the frame of a large, larger narrative structure. The writing is the backbone of the story, but many disciplines build on it along the way. Body language, character staging, cameras, and gameplay all add to the story being told. Write knowing that you are building the frame. And take time to understand the spaces you leave in your writing for other disciplines to create a well-rounded experience in your cutscenes. Another job well done. <laughs> and I'll take questions. <laughs> Cinematic design. Oh. Uh, um, I think one of the most impactful I did was um, the final Carver scene in Walking Dead season two, episode three. Um, I think the one I'm most proud of and that I, I look back very fondly on is uh, the end of Knights of the Eternal Throne expansion for Star Wars: The Old Republic. Uh, the final. Uh, scene with Valkorion and uh, just the very conclusion of the story that it was technically like three cutscenes on top of each other but the total of that was 16 minutes <laughs> it was a lot and uh, but I was happy to be able to execute the very end of the expansion and it felt, felt really good what was your favorite game that you worked on um, Tales from Borderlands yeah, I, I was, I was very intrigued by the just light-hearted nature of Borderlands. Uh, I was never much of a zombie fan. I knew how to create zombie stuff, but I wasn't uh, like I didn't uh, consume that media on my own. Um, and I just loved Borderlands, and I loved the idea of you're in the Borderlands universe, but you don't have a gun, and you're really bad at this, and there are vault hunters all shooting around you, and you're just trying not to die. I just thought that was a very cool uh, narrative to jump into. Yeah. Have you found any uh, processes or tools or flows that kind of helped you streamline the process of taking the written word and going through the time-consuming labor of adapting it to a cutscene? Uh, every cinematic, art, cinematic designer or cinematic artist does it a little differently. Uh, per, for me personally, uh, I like to block it out in the, the space of the 3D program. And, uh, and I also like to draw it down, like a, a football play. Where I go, okay, they start here and then they move here. And um, a lot of it is just reflecting on where are the big emotional shifts in the scene? When, where do I need to change the staging to you know, make the person walk away? or make people come closer together. Uh, yeah, it's mostly, uh, mostly for me, it's just like drawing top down and exploring in the 3D tool. I also know other cinematic designers that will draw full storyboards to really get the emotional feeling that they're looking for, but I just kind of, I eyeball it. Yeah. Are there any other resources or materials that you particularly 
draw inspiration from uh, in your process and in your time building up to the point that you are now that you would recommend? Uh, stuff outside of games or? Uh, yeah. Could be games, could be other, like a, you mean like a textbook or something. That you yeah, can yeah. Um, well, if you're looking for uh, lessons in cinematography or anything like that, uh, I highly recommend Hollywood Camera Work. It is a uh, video series. It's incredibly dry, and you will fall asleep, but it is so good at condensing everything that's just the basic lessons of film. Uh, in terms of media that I, I really find inspirational, uh, uh, I always come back to Hot Fuzz. Uh, I just love the cinematography there and how much is, st is told in the script and how much is told with the camera and how well they work together to tell the really good jokes with the framing. Like, it's, it's rare to find. Um, and Mass Effect is definitely one of my greatest uh, inspirations because that's, uh, that, that was what got me back into like larger adventure games. I was kind of, you know, out of them at that point. Um, but just the the moment of being able to become a specter and seeing the character myself being in that role empowered me so much. Just even as a person outside of the game, I'm like, oh, this is magic. I want to be part of this. <laughs> Knowing how much you know it can affect people and change people's lives. Yeah. What made you want to be in the game industry? Interactive narrative. Uh, I always wanted to be a storyteller, but what I really like about games is that it, the story you're telling is a dialogue between you and the player. And you are, you're never in full control of the story. And what you're doing is you're creating a framework for a player to put themselves into and become part of the world you've created. And I think that's so exciting. I know it's incredibly challenging. It's much harder than just writing a linear story, but it creates an interesting space where you're like, I made, I made this playground, come play in it with me. And it's like, oh, I can adjust, you know, I can, I can get feedback and I can make it work better for more people. Um, but I just love that dialogue. Yeah. To what extent do you think about music or audio or uh, work directly with audio personnel during this part of the iterative, iterative oh. process? Uh, if I can, I'd love to do that. Um, I did that when I was directing. Uh, as a cinematic designer, I don't have much control when I'm just given a scene and I have to execute it. Uh, but I really, really love music. I listen to game soundtracks, movie soundtracks constantly. And I think that uh, I didn't have enough to talk about in this uh, talk about that. But music is definitely another emotional cue that will set a change in the scene. And you know, the dialogue could be the same, the camera framing could stay the same, but if the music changes, the audience will be like, uh-oh, something's about to happen. Uh, so I think music is incredibly expressive. And you know, going between like something that's just more drama heavy, where like the slightest pin drop of change, you're just like, ah. Um, to Looney Tunes on the other side, where every single action is punctuated by music. I love that whole emotional spectrum. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. When you are writing cinematics and moving cinematics around for a linear story, uh, how does that differ from uh, a story with multiple endings? How would you take it? What would you take into account? How would you so writing for multiple endings and for how it affects cinematics? Exactly. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's tough. I haven't seen a lot of games with very dramatic branching endings. Usually we all come to the same point, but with a couple of conditionals, a little varied. Um, it's one of the things that, you know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't like ex uh, exasperated by it, but you look at, um, Mass Effect 3, and I mean, everybody complains about the ending. I don't think it's that bad. I think it's great. I think it's, you know, but people complain that, oh, it's not different enough. And uh, I mean, most of that just comes down to budget because, you know, you can't make that many endings. You don't have that many assets or time or money. Um, but I think what's really important outside of doing a branching ending is, is the feeling that your player is feeling different. Can you? 
Can you create different feelings at the ending with the same ending? If so, go that route. If not, uh, you want to keep it light and breezy and don't make it too long. Leave it on a cliffhanger or maybe hint at things. Maybe frame part of a person walking by and then they walk out of frame they just like drop a photograph or something like that and it leaves you asking questions and it lets you fill in the blanks so that you don't need to show everything on screen because you don't have the budget to do three endings, but you are leaving enough that the players feel fulfilled in the choices that they made uh, to feel like it was their own unique ending. Yeah. Uh, could you point out some, um, some of the common problems you have in taking stuff the writers have done and turning it into the uh, Like stuff they've written and stuff I've had to work around? Uh, yeah, so it's kind of um, the the bit here is off. A lot of stuff on the left here is stuff that I've definitely run into. I run into all of these, uh, and yeah, it's it usually comes down to me figuring out like, okay, well this is in the script, or oh, they fall into an ocean, and I need to figure out how we're going to make that work. Do we have the VFX for that? If we're not, like, what are we going to do? Or do we need to just like when they hit the water, cut to a different level where you're underwater and you see like maybe a little splash, but we don't see like water physics. We just see, um, one of my favorite things is giving and receiving objects because this happens a lot in uh, Star Wars and the Old Republic. And we had so many cut scenes. We had um, 18 cinematic designers making a, like a, a 12, player character stories or whatever, but all the quests, we had tons of quests, and like bronze quests, every single quest that you went to in Star Wars had a cutscene attached to it, which was bonkers. But uh, whenever we needed them to hand off objects, if the frame is here, we just do it underneath the frame. So they just lean in and go, here you go. And we never show the object, and it shows up in the player's inventory after the cutscene, but it was a very cheap way to just say, oh, you know, you don't have to deal with this, this object or showing this object, because then you run into, like, if it's one object, I have to figure out, oh, it's attached to this character's hand, and then it's attached to that character's hand. Where does that switch happen? Or you have two versions of the object, and when they're handing it off, at some point you just flip the visibility, and you say, okay, that person's rock is now visible, and the other one is off. Um, but yeah, handing them to the frame is, is such a great shorthand, and everybody gets it, you know, it's just like, oh, you're giving me the object, and then it shows up in my inventory. Um, yeah, and, uh, and like I mentioned, the, the crowds with uh, Walking Dead, you know, just uh, coming up with creative solutions on very tight budgets, but I love the problem-solving aspect of it. So uh, Telltale was like a really loved company and they were like the best at like cinematic games. So naturally it came as a shock when they went out of business. Are you at liberty to say what may have led up to their uh, untimely demise? I wasn't there when it happened. I hadn't been there for a couple of years so I can't really shed much light on what happened there. Um, I can say it was one of the coolest places to work. It was incredibly stressful and I you know, would never dismiss the, the working conditions that people have already talked about, but it was one of the most exciting creative teams I've ever worked with. There's all the people that were drawn to telling interactive narrative, you know, like a moth to a flame, seemed to congregate at Telltale, and when we're on the floor, we're all trying to figure out, like, do, do we care? Do we care about this moment? Is this impactful? Uh, it, was so, it was so cool and so exciting to be in that room. I like a little bit of both. I, don't know. I mean, I think nonlinear storytelling uh, has its strengths in that it gives more freedom to the player to experience the story in the way that they want to. Uh, it does make it harder to set certain uh, goals and certain linear narrative goals that we would see in film. So, especially at, um, when we're working on larger projects, it's harder to uh, go nonlinearly because we can't. We can't budget every single time they come to this scene. It has to play out a, di a little differently based on where they are in the story. Uh, so it, the bigger the game, the bigger the story, the more you know Hollywood treatment we want, the more linear we're going to get. 
but if you are going with simpler graphics or you know simply just text or very basic uh, cutscenes and procedural content, you can get stuff like 80 Days, where 80 Days is incredibly nonlinear procedural and it just goes in so many different directions every time, and that's really cool. Uh, it's harder when you're doing cutscenes to make entry points with nonlinear uh, narratives so that it makes sense every time, but it's not impossible. I think uh, personally, like I want to, I love it when I do things in a certain order and the game recognizes that I did that, and uh, so a character will comment and like, oh, well, you just you just talked to Cindy. Well, let me tell you this thing, and uh, it's harder to do that with cutscenes because it's just a lot of budget and time investment. Yeah? How do you adapt to tightening production schedules and deadlines where like one day you have the time to make Fury and Lust dance around each other and the next day you find, oh, you have to deliver something in four days? Just how I, how I work with the budget, yeah, the sure. time budget of it. Um, Oh man, it's it's different from studio to studio. I mean, it was easier uh, on Darksiders because we were working with an external team and giving them feedback. Uh, so it was very much based on their schedule and what they could produce. And sometimes there were times where we're like, well, we can't, you want this big thing, we can't make it. I'm like, okay, well, where can we meet in the middle? Uh, where can we execute this so that we get the emotional, uh, emotional moment we want, but we're not gonna make this huge epic battle scene. Uh, at Telltale, it was a lot of sort of flying by the seat of your pants because a lot of scenes would get written, rewritten at the last minute. And uh, we also, as cinematic designers, would implement all the animation. So uh, we had a library of animations to build performances off of. So the animators didn't have to animate every scene. The cinematic designers built that performance. Everything from a walk to a weight shift to an eyebrow raise, we put it all in there. And uh, sometimes you had you needed the uh, character to do something you didn't have an animation for. So we did what we called Frankensteining, where you just take a bunch of animations and like, I'm gonna take the arm off of this animation and then I'm gonna take the torso off this one and just put this one at 50% and it kind of looks like he's reaching for the thing off the shelf. Uh, and that's how we kind of got around that. So uh, it's so much just creative problem solving and uh, really thinking about, okay, do, do we need to show this? Do we need to show this? Can I cut this? Can I allude to it? Can it be a sound effect off screen? Uh, maybe you can still record dialogue and have someone like, you know, like you would do in film or the ADR where they're like, oh, look over there. And it just adds because you can't show it. Um, yeah, I'd look to, uh, is it possible to take it out? And can you creatively work around it? Yeah. My question is, uh, uh, do you usually work with existing characters? Sorry, repeat that? Uh, like, when you have some characters and you just work with them, you do not create your own. So they're established characters that uh, you you didn't create, but you're working with them. Yeah. Is it usually where you work? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and most of the, as a cinematic designer, definitely, because yeah. it's created by a writer uh, and uh, I've only recently been begun to make my own characters uh, at Gunfire and getting to write a little bit there. But most of the time I work with other characters. And what I do is I immerse myself in their personality and what's written about them. If I can talk to the writer directly and say, well, what do you think, what do you think Reese would do in this moment? Like, what's his personality? Uh, and I love Reese. He's adorable and bumbling, but he, he kind of wants to do the right thing. I don't know. Um, but I, I spend a lot of time just thinking about you know, random situations like, okay, I'm, I'm building this scene, but I'm building it with this character archetype in mind and this personality, so how would they, how would they work in this scene? You know, where Reese positions himself in a conversation in the room with Fiona is going to be much different than with Valerie. His blocking, his uh, acting is going to be completely different uh, based on his relationship with other people. Same if you put another character in there. So just immersing yourself in their personality. And uh, I have a little bit of acting experience of so just going back and like, just trying to pretend to be Reese for a little bit and say, if I were Reese, what would I be doing in this situation?
was the most significant thing that you hone in on your craft. And then for someone brand new, let's say some new one coming into the industry, what advice would you give them? So getting into cinematics, uh, I think the the biggest thing for honing my craft there was uh, just, yeah, Hollywood camera work, definitely absorbing myself in that. Um, and uh, I mean, just creating, that's always my big thing, is just constantly create, 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 make mediocre art, get it out, make it, make the next thing, make the next thing, make the next thing, uh, just through repetition. Uh, the Dragon Age origin tool that I think you can get for free now has a cinematic tool that's similar to uh, a lot of the cinematic tools that uh, studios are using. Unfortunately, I, I don't think there's really the same kind of cinematic tool in Unreal or Unity yet. I keep looking. I want to see it. I want. They have timelines, but it's still not exactly robust. Um, Sequencer and Unreal is getting there, but it's slow going. Um, and yeah, I think. Uh, in cinematics, you want to think about just like where you're coming from in film. Watch lots of films. Uh, think about story structure. And for me, it was like I want to tell stories, but I want to tell stories with the camera. And remember that the camera is an actor in your scene too. That the camera is telling a story as much as the characters on screen. That's probably the the biggest thing I think about. Yeah. What is the name of the Dragon Age? Uh, I think it's, I'm not exactly sure, I think it's Dragon Age Origins tool set or something like that. But if you search for the Dragon Age Origins tool, I think it's on Steam. I think you can download it uh, and play with it. And it is pretty old, uh, but it will get you, uh, I think they had like a couple animations included in there as well, and a function to turn ta uh, TTS, so text-to-speech, where you could turn stuff you've written into text-to-speech lines that are fired inside the cutscene, so you can play with that. Anybody else? What's your opinion on using uh, actual camera, the decent eye, like a physical real world camera, when not working with the system the editor as a way of bringing Like as a uh, uh, like a layout, seeing what it would look like or Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I've actually recently gotten into physical cameras. I spent most of my career just in cameras inside the, cam the computer. Uh, I think uh, understanding uh, focal lengths is a really big one. Um, it's something you can't quite get with your phone, uh, but just being able to understand the difference between a wide lens and a long lens. And, uh, because all of that language is translated into the tools, and we have, you know, oh, this is a 30 millimeter, and if you have no reference, you know, when I first started, I was like, I don't know what 30 millimeter is, but I know that it, I can see a lot more. <laughs> so I would just play with the camera that, that seemed to fit what I was looking for, uh, and understanding um, depth of field, uh, you know, it's, it's very uh, common to see a lot of cinematic designers when they start. They just want to up that depth of field so bad, and they want it to, they want everything to be super blurry. And it's like this is not what a realistic camera would do, uh, unless it was a very uh, low aperture. Uh, but just like understanding um, uh, focal length, aperture, um, and ISO, and just having the basics of that down, even if you don't have access to a DSLR camera or anything like that, just being able to review on that. Uh, will make it much easier when you get into digital tools. Yeah? Do you have any thoughts on the use of cinematography in other aspects of game design, not just in cutscenes, but in how the camera frames the player or the world or something, or something like that? Hell yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I've always been interested in camera design. Uh, in just in gameplay cameras, I think that again the camera is a storyteller too, and it's it's framing the character, and it's it is your key for seeing information, but it can also shape your emotions. Uh, there's a talk, I think it's 2014, um, but it's a GDC talk about the cameras in Tomb Raider, the first one, uh, the first reboot, 
and uh, he talks about the radio tower scene uh, where she is climbing, the, uh, Lara Croft is climbing this, uh, this radio tower, she has to turn this thing on, and the way the camera frames her in gameplay, the, the camera is still under player control, because it's still gameplay and they have to climb, but the way the camera is framing her, it's framing her from below and it's shooting straight up, and it's trying to create this feeling of vertigo, and there's a certain checkpoint where she gets to it, the camera pushes in, she grabs on, she looks down, the camera looks down with her, and you see how far she's come, and you hear the wind rushing by you, and then the camera points back up again, and you're like, oh, oh, I gotta keep going, and like, I literally started to feel a little vertigo just from playing that scene, and it was a lot of the camera. The camera was making me feel like I was there, and that uh, I, the, the angle was shaping uh, my emotional state based on what the character was going through. Uh, so that's definitely more advanced in terms of uh, tools and trying to uh, get the gameplay camera to do what you want, but I think it's a very good consideration because I think a lot of people put the camera behind the player and they think about, am I showing enough information, but they're not always thinking about what, how am I shaping this emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the way you frame a character changes how you feel about them. Uh, the the uh, most common ones are like, if you shoot from below, you're making this person look powerful or dangerous or, you know, scary. Um, if you shoot from above, you're making them feel smaller and distant and emotionally um, distant. And uh, there's so much in camera language that uh, shapes the way we feel about characters without any dialogue, and maybe not without any emotional expression on a person. Uh, there's just certain shorthand that we've learned when watching movies that we don't even realize that uh, we are experiencing, but there's psychological effects that the camera, the way the camera moves, the way the camera frames things, changes the way we feel about them. Uh, so I highly recommend looking into that stuff. And, Again, yeah, camera, camera is an actor. Camera is telling a story. Yeah? Uh, what do you think, uh, in regards to stuff like mocap and, and more involved animation tools, do you think we're sort of, is this as good as it's going to get? Or, or do you have any expectations for what, how technology will evolve in the next couple of years? Uh, man, I can't predict what mocap is going to do. Uh, I think it's really cool what we're doing, and we're constantly seeing more tech demos um, on you know tracking faces and acting and stuff like that. My personal ethos is uh, the more you try to make it look realistic, the quicker you're going to be dated in your technology and the way you look at things. Uh, I think that emotional expression on characters can be cartoony and can be pushing beyond the limits and be more honest with how they're expressing themselves. Like you look at um, Pixar films and the way the characters emote, it's definitely cartoony and they got squash and stretch and all this very big expression that a human person couldn't do, but we can relate closer to that experience because they are physically embodying the emotion that we feel. And that if we're pushing too closely to be realistic with our characters, they always, I mean, they still kind of look stiff. Um, they look really impressive. Uh, the closest, I think, is Uncharted and Last of Us, um, but it's still not quite, I don't think it's as emotionally expressive as it could be um, to go realistic. What I'm really interested in is uh, AI and deep learning and the, uh, the stuff that Ubisoft has been doing with you know, procedural crowds and uh, getting characters to move around the scene and learn things and then uh, exude certain behaviors as a human, trying to like, oh, I'm a robot, I'm trying to be human. Um, but they're learning more, and I think that's really cool, just in terms of scope and size. Um, but when it comes down to like a very minute uh, emotional expression, I think that's still very hard for a computer to capture. Yeah? So you have emotional goal. So how do you work with environment lights uh, that's, I mean, that's definitely some uh, department you want to talk to, and if you are in a position to be able to change the environment and say, look, we need this, we need this thrown up super high because this character is supposed to be super intimidating, 
um, that's good to have that communication. If you are further down the line, uh, where I was very often as a cinematic designer, as like, I'm given the environment, I'm given the direction, and told, go, and I have to work with what I got. Um, you can sometimes adjust things, but you have to learn how to be flexible and say, okay, well, if I can't, if I can't quite fit what I want in this space, how can I adjust my execution to uh, fit in the space I've been given? And then if there's something like a really big problem, like we needed a door there, the person needs to leave and there's no door, you can talk to people about that, but often you uh, need to work within the constraints you have. And in terms of audio, audio was always after me, like they, they had it worse than I did, so the audio and VFX were always uh, after my work. Uh, and, and lighting, um, is the same thing. It's it's part of it's under the umbrella of environment at most companies I've worked at. So uh, I can request lights, but often you know if it's too much of an ask, they'll say you know like oh we don't have the budget for that in the level. We can't afford more lights. And I'm like well this is th I always come back to if I can't get the thing I'm thinking of in my head, what is the feeling I want to accomplish? And can I talk to this person in another department and say okay well if we can't do that, this is what I'd like to achieve. How would you achieve it? And that allows them to collaborate with you and say, oh, well, maybe we could do this thing and use their expertise to help you towards the same goal. Cool. I'm just going to end it. If you want to come talk to me, I'll be up here for a bit. So thanks, guys. <laughs>